your life is always trying to teach you something. You may not want to learn what it's trying to teach you, but your life is always trying to teach you something. Whether life is going easy, it's trying to teach you something. You know what life is teaching you when life is easy? It's teaching you what works. It's teaching you the habits and the kinds of people that make you feel good. It's teaching you what life working looks like. And you know what life is teaching you when life is hard? It's teaching you what is broken. It's trying to wake you up. And what I've learned the hard way, do not do what I did. I am so damn stubborn. Like if you think about life as a giant school, life is the greatest school you will ever attend. You can enjoy it. You can hate it. But life is always going to be school because life is always teaching you something. And do not make the mistake that Mel Robbins makes because I'm a very stubborn student. And what happens is if you don't get the lesson that life is trying to teach you, life just brings out the sledgehammer. And that's what happened to me. It just hit me over the head with a freaking sledgehammer. And so I want you to stop for a second right now. And I want you to think, what is my life trying to teach me right now? And here's a simple exercise that my friend Pete gave me. It's so dead simple, it's, it's kind of nuts. You're going to take out a piece of paper. He said, Mel, take out a piece of paper. And I, I'm, I have my journal here. You can hear me like flipping it open right now because this is like what actually happened. December 21st, last year, I was speaking with my friend Pete Sheehan. I got to find the page here. I should have put a little, uh, oh, here it is right here. Um, and he said, Mel, I want you to draw a line down a center of a page. And on the left-hand side, for the little ears, I apologize, but this is what it says, shit I hate. On the right-hand side, things I love. I want you to write down everything that is not working that you hate about your life. And here's a nicer way to say it. Where in your life do you feel friction? Where in your life do you feel friction? It could be in your body. It could be in your relationships. It could be at work. It could be when you look at your bank account. Where is life creating friction? It's hard. You're frustrated. Everything feels like a fight. This is where the lesson is, everybody. Friction is how your life teaches you to wake up and pay attention. Friction is where your life is trying to hit you with a sledgehammer because life wants you to be happy. Life wants you to feel good about yourself. Life wants you to enjoy yourself. Life wants you to live in alignment with what's meant for you. And you see, when you feel friction, I felt friction in every single aspect of my life. I felt friction in my body. I felt friction in my mental health. There was not a place when I sat down to do this exercise, what do I hate, where there was not friction. That's how bad it was. I wrote, I hate packing on a Sunday and leaving my family to drive home and be alone. I hate flying alone. I hate working alone. I hate being stuck somewhere and not being able to get home. I hate the fact that I feel like I've got to generate all the ideas and keep going and going and going and that I can't stop. I hate feeling insignificant. I hate feeling disconnected. I hate feeling like I'm just going with no plan. I hate feeling disorganized and dropping balls and ADHD and lack of support on the administrative side of my life. I hate feeling overwhelmed. I hate having to set up technology. I hate never seeing my friends. I hate not knowing what's going on. I hate having nobody to handle things to. I hate that I feel like everything is a broken process. I hate working remote. I, not, I hate not knowing how everything I'm working toward is going to connect to something bigger. Wow, that's a lot of stuff that I hate. I hate my negative thoughts. It goes on and on and on. My list of things that were causing friction. I hate that I don't live with Chris and my husband. I hate that I don't see my friends. I hate that I'm constantly traveling in order to work. I hate the feeling of loneliness. It just goes on and on and on. Now, here's what's interesting. Life is trying to teach me something. 
And what my life was teaching me with a gigantic sledgehammer is that it's not working. It's not working. Wherever you have friction, there is either a broken process or a broken set of relationships, or there is something that is no longer aligned with you, or there are the wrong people around you. That's all that it is. And see, we get so attached to the way that things are that we don't get the lessons. And when you don't get the lessons, you close off what could be. And I'm here to tell you that you deserve to have a life where you don't feel friction every day. You're not wired to live a life where you feel that intense. And I can give you some other examples. Like, you know, when our son was in the fourth grade, he would just explode when we had to sit down and do homework at night, like full on temper tantrums. You know what that is? That is friction in a young person's body. That is him feeling this deep sense that something's off. And when that happened for our son and he would pound his head against the kitchen island and he would cry before he had to go to school, he didn't know what was wrong, but he was trying to teach us something. Life was trying to teach us something. His body intrinsically knew that something was off. And what turned out to be off is that the kid had profound dyslexia, profound dysgraphia, executive functioning, attention stuff going on, and he couldn't sit in the classroom and neurologically do what was being asked of him to do. And so I'm here to tell you, when you make this list of things that you hate, the areas of your life that create friction for you right now, that's where the lessons are. And those lessons will repeat until you learn them. Do not be stubborn. Do not look at the friction as if something's wrong. Look at the friction in your life as an opportunity to create alignment, as an opportunity to pull your life back into the other column, which is things that I love. And there was so much that I loved in my life. There was the therapy that I was doing. There were the time that I was spending with Chris and our son and building a house. There was all the new things we were working on. There was the podcast that was out in the future. All of this stuff. You got to walk toward the things. You got to do more of what's in alignment. But I'm telling you right now, the lessons are in the hard stuff. The lessons are in the friction. So that's lesson number one. Your life is trying to teach you something. It always is. Stop resisting the lesson. Because I have found in personal experience that if you refuse to learn the lesson, life will show up with a sledgehammer. When I look backwards now, I can see that I've been addicted to being busy for a long time. I can see that I needed to deal with this friction for a long time. It's just got louder and louder and louder to the point where I could no longer ignore it. I could also see looking backwards that I had often had people in my inner circle that were doing things like lying and betraying me, and I had ignored it. And I had made excuses for people. And so guess what? Those betrayals just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it was so painful that I had to finally learn the lesson. And so friction in your life is a good thing because friction wakes you up. Friction puts a spotlight on what's not working. And friction only builds everyone until you learn the lesson and you make a decision to turn toward it. After doing something so extraordinary, and you also have made a huge difference in uh, women's lives around the world because you are extraordinarily philanthropic, $40 million worth of product and monetary donations um, to people that are struggling with cancer. And what is next for you? Hmm. Because you are right now in the middle of figuring out on this next leg of the journey called life what your purpose is mm -hmm. and what your next thing is going to be. What tools are you using or how are you thinking about it? And it's really important topic because so many people, particularly after the last three years, have had a profound life change thrust on them. Yes. 
And they're looking ahead at an open road, wondering what their purpose is going to be, what they're going to do. Can you just speak to that person for a minute about mm -hmm. how you're going about figuring it out? Yeah. So one thing I just want to um, remind everyone to, Mel, because I think people put so much pressure on themselves that their purpose has to be their job mm. or their next job. And a lot of times we can be doing a job that's fine. And, and, and maybe for family reasons, we need that health coverage and we need that paycheck and 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 your purpose can be found in the things you do outside of that right there's a lot of ways uh to listen to that knowing and your gut and 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 then when it feels right you know that's aligned with with who you're born to be mm -hmm. and how you're born to um show up in the world and so for me right now um you know, there's that famous saying, just because you can, should you, right? Mm. There's a big part of me now with all these, you know, could I go launch a bunch of businesses? Yes, <laughs> right? Um, and what I feel drawn to is 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 literally, because here's the deal. Yes, I've built a billion dollar business. Yes, I have other companies that I invest in. You but, also are married and you have two beautiful children. Yes, a two-year-old and you're and four -year -old. incredibly uh, devoted to your family. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing is like, that's all part of my story. But when I, when I, when I look at my real story, it, it, it meaning the part that ties deeply to, to my purpose, like my real story is a girl who went from not believing in herself mm -hmm. to learning how to. And so when I wake up in the morning and I think about the things I've done so far, the things I hope for my kids for it is, is, and how I built a billion dollar business, it was really through seeing women, helping them see themselves mm. and believe in themselves and believe they are worthy and enough. And that's what makes, like, that's what fires me up every morning. So when I think about what I'm stepping into next. Yeah. Um, you know, I wrote Believe It, um, which is about my book about how to go from underestimated to unstoppable, donated all the proceeds. I'm donating all the proceeds around 100%. Um, I funded leadership. Hold on, hold on. Um, let's just underscore that. So she writes a New York Times bestseller, donates all the proceeds from the book. Yeah. To nonprofits. Just donates them. Yeah. And the book is just... Um, for it's me. incredible. Mm, thank you. It's like a little manual that you should have on your bedside table because Jamie will be smiling at you yes. and you'll see that you're not alone, that we're in this together. And her example of learning how to go from doubting herself to believing in herself is the journey that each and every one of us is on. Yeah. And so you're kind of in this soup of knowing that this is the area where you want to focus the impact, but you're yeah. not being a very, very, very good friend of yours. I know that you're not, it's still a fuzzy target, so to speak, mm. as our friend Dean would say, it's a fuzzy target. If somebody kind of has a sense that there's something more, but they don't quite have their, they haven't had that aha moment yet that yeah. you had almost 14 years ago sitting on that television set, yeah. I'm going to make makeup and I'm going to bring real women in. I'm going to show my skin and I'm going to yeah. solve this problem. I'm going to make people think that they're beautiful because they are beautiful no matter what they're about. And you did it. You did it. But if you're in the soup yeah. and you don't have the vision yet, is there an exercise or something that you would recommend that we all do while we're waiting for that clarity and that epiphany to strike? Yeah. Two things. One, waiting for it to be perfect can be the lowest vibration, big, biggest excuse. Mm. Uh, number one reason why people just never try and never get started. So I don't think, I think it's rare to ever have complete clarity. Like this is exactly perfect. for, it. And that's why, you know, I think, I think uh, two things. I think just taking a step and seeing how it feels is good, tuning into your knowing. I also think, you know, Dean, so 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 you mentioned our friend Dean, he was saying at the fuzzy target, 
you know, he, he was saying something to me recently about, you know, almost like when you're about to aim a, a bow and arrow and you're about to let go of the arrow, he's like, you can aim and, and turn it and twist it a few times before you let go of the arrow. It's okay to wait a little bit and just make sure you're going to aim at the right thing. Mm. Um, and, you know, so, so this year, for example, um, I've kind of been doing that. I've been saying, how do things feel? You know, I have the gift and blessing of being here with you right now. How does this feel? Feels amazing. So does this mean you, you're you. going to do a talk show? <laughs> maybe, maybe you could you could teach me all the ropes, Mal, and then um, yeah. Hardly, but I am a failed talk show host. Uh, okay, don't even. You that wanna, is true. My talk whole... show got canceled. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I can tell you why. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to apply the lessons from Professor Purvis, but I'd like to hear <laughs> you tell me why. I think our steps are ordered. Why? I think because you are going to own all of what you're doing and make it so much bigger than anyone else who owned it could have made it. Mm -hmm. So uh, by that definition, I think you're the most successful talk show host. That's the first <laughs> thing. Um, At least in the podcast. <laughs> but no, I love, I think it's all going to be the same. I think a show is a show. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. the world's changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I love, too, that you can do this show on your terms, it's right? True. You can do it on your terms. And that's why it is so huge, because it's on your terms. Well, like you, and maybe this is one of the reasons why we have become such dear friends in such a short period of time. And I often say on the show that I truly believe that the best years of your life and the best friendships that you'll have are on the road ahead. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the reason why we connected so profoundly, even though we are different in many, many ways, yeah. is that it goes back to the Denny's waitress. Like at my core, I am still the waitress making money, waiting tables at the Red Rooster Tavern on Scenic Drive in North Muskegon, Michigan. Same as you, stalling because the fryer has now broken and the fried perch is not coming out. And I'm talking to the tourists from Chicago and I'm treating everybody kindly. And I know that all I want to do is impact people's lives that are just got their head down and they don't feel very seen or heard. And I want to make them know that they have it within them to tap into this incredible power inside them to create whatever they want in life. Yes. And it starts with believing yes. that you can and having somebody like you on who has demonstrated that is really yeah. important for people to hear. You know, on that topic of friendship, I love so much that you are the friend that people need to your audience. Like, and, and what I mean by that, and I'm honored to be the friend for this episode with you to everyone. And, and what I mean by that, Mel, is I think you and I love each other for who we authentically are. The Denny's waitress, the Red Rooster, waitress, <laughs> right? And we also are friends that that um, help pull each other into yes. who we're becoming. Yes. And I think so often, and that's why I love, um, and, and your show also, as you know, of course, but I just want to call it out, that your show can be this for people who feel like, how do I find those friends that pull help pull me into my future? Because so often the people around us, while they might mean really, really well and love us dearly, pull us into our past or for their own comfort zone, want us to stay the person we were or are. And it's so important because we're talking about purpose yeah. to try and, and, and add friends to your circle who, who truly want the best for you, not just what they think is the best for them in you, <laughs> but like want the best for you. And you do that for me. I do that for you. Yes. This show, your show I know does that for people as well. Yes. And so um honored to be part of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanna just highlight one final thing, and then I have a surprise to tell um you listening to us right now. Yes, we have a surprise for you. It's really exciting with Professor Purpose over here. <laughs> um <clears throat> and I I I'm having like a menopause moment where like the drawbridge is open in my brain and now the drawbridge is not closing and connecting the dots on this <laughs> profound thing that I wanted to say. So let me see if I can, Everything if I can you say order this. Profound. Hardly, hardly, <laughs> but I appreciate you saying that. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned, and it took me a long time to learn this, is that there is so much success and happiness to go around. Mm. 
And when you lift other people up yeah. and you reach out for help, that um, your success comes faster and it's richer, yes. both emotionally and in terms of monetarily. And um, I just remembered what I wanted to say, and it's this. And it goes back to purpose. It goes back to that knowing and staying connected to your intention and this unique thing that you have to give to the world. It is not only your responsibility in life to stay connected to your knowing. It is your responsibility to advocate for it because only you have seen it in your heart and mind. Of course, your family says no. They don't even know what they're, you're talking about because they only know the person that you've been in the past. Mm -hmm. Of course, the investor is going to say no. Why? Because they only know what they know. Your knowing is yours. Yeah. And you have to stay connected to it and you have to keep describing it or advocating for it or explaining it to people so that they can see it too. And it's not until you demonstrate what you see in your own heart and mind by continuing to walk toward it, continuing to talk about it, continuing to believe in it, that it will become a reality. And that's why people say no, because it's your knowing. Mm -hmm not theirs. And so in a weird way, a ton of no's or a lot of friction or bumping up against things as you're trying, you can't understand why don't people get this? Why isn't this working? It's because it's your knowing, not theirs. Okay. Got it. Mel, how do I get started? How do I achieve this? <laughs> okay. This has been fun, girl, but this is a lot like buying a brand new planner for the new school year. So now what do I do? Okay. Well, step number one, Based on the research, the second that you define your goals, and we have now defined the goals, we are using the research, I'm feeling super empowered, I hope you are too, you have to make the first milestone super, super easy because that means it feels like you've already done it, okay? So we got to make a super simple first step, and scientists even have a name for this. Scientists call this incremental illusion. That's what we're using, incremental illusion. If you make the first few milestones really easy to achieve, you will be more likely to succeed at this goal because nothing, and I mean nothing, is more motivating than progress. And research from the University of Chicago gives us a great example of what I'm talking about, okay? So you know how you go to a coffee shop and they have these offers where if you buy 10 cups of coffee, you get the next coffee free. Here's a little trick that's pretty interesting that uses this effect, this illusion, okay? So they gave one group of people a card that was buy 10 cups of coffee, get one free card, but it was blank, okay? Okay. They gave another group of people a buy 12 cups of coffee, and then you get a free card, but two of the slots were already checked off. Progress had already been made. It's still the same thing. You're still having to do 10, but guess what? The folks that were given the card with two slots already filled in, they moved through that card faster by checking the boxes twice, listening to this podcast, check. You're no longer at square one. You've defined your goals. Uh, I can tell you some other things. You want to do the smallest step possible. Chris gave me a book about dahlias, those flowers that I love for the holidays. Check. I'm in box two. <laughs> if you can take the smallest step today, can you do a Google search? Could you spend a little time journaling? What's something that you could do? You can't think of something? No problem. I've got something based on the research you could do. Step number two, check box number two. Tell someone you admire about this goal. This debunks decades old research from 2009 from researchers at Yale that said that you shouldn't tell anybody about your goals. But here's the hook. You need to tell somebody you admire. You got to tell the right people about your goals. This comes from a set of new studies from Ohio State. 
Researchers found that you show greater goal commitment and performance when you tell your goal to someone you admire or whose opinion you value. And these results run counter to this widely reported 2009 study from NYU that suggested that telling other people your goal is actually counterproductive. And so here's what you can do. Just tell somebody you admire. Here's how I'm doing it. I'm sharing these goals with you. And I'm going to go share these goals with my family. And I'm going to share these goals with my friends. I'm going to talk to the woman that I met this summer that is growing dahlias and learn from her. That's another step. This is like us checking off the boxes on that free coffee card and getting you to start seeing yourself making progress. And the final thing, the second that this episode is over, do a tiny thing, one step forward. This comes from a recent study at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine that showed that starting right away resulted in the most change. Do not wait for Monday. Do not wait for the weekend. Do not wait until later. The most important thing you could do, that little box you're going to check, is when this podcast is over, spend five minutes taking a step. Whew. Now I get to talk about the most life-changing part of all of this. You ready? The whole reason why goal setting is important is because it creates meaning and purpose in your life. And that's the most important part. Your goals are not really meant to be achieved. The most important part is that you're pursuing something. That's why goals matter so much. I mean, remember the research we talked about in the very beginning? Those goals that you've defined and refined based on the research, having them, taking little steps toward them, it's going to make you happier. It will suppress negative emotions. It makes you feel like you're up to something. And your life is going to be way more satisfying having those one, two, or three goals that you're working on than having no goals at all. And there's a reason why I'm going to hammer this idea of pursuing the goal. Okay. First of all, I don't want you to try to get this perfect. I just want you to try. And the second reason why is that when you achieve a goal, the irony is it's not as satisfying as you think it's going to be. Setting goals makes you happy. Working on goals makes you happy. Achieving goals does not create or promise lasting happiness. Yeah, it is awesome. When you finally get to the top of that mountain you've been climbing, you take in the view, you catch your breath, you sit down on a rock, you take a selfie, you eat some gorp, and then you stand up and you climb back down. It's over. Yeah, it's amazing when you pay off your bills. You celebrate. You feel the burst of pride. And then you go on with life. The point and the purpose of achieving and setting goals that are deeply personal that have a will and a why and a how and a way, right? Is because when you have goals, you're up to something. You're committing to your own growth and you're getting intentional about things that are relevant and important that you want to see yourself doing. And we have a tendency to overestimate how happy we're going to be when we achieve the goal. And there's even a name for it. That's how common this is. It's called the arrival fallacy. It's this fallacy that once you lose the weight, once you get the job, once you find the romance, once you reach the destination, that then, then I'll be in nirvana. Then I'll be happy. Then, I'll, no. Tal Ben Shara, the Harvard trained positivity psychology expert, he has debunked this thing in study after study after study. And all you have to do is look at the number of Olympians or movie stars that we think have achieved it all that then are just plummeting and struggling with mental health illnesses after their greatest achievements. And we're like, what? How could they possibly do? They have gold medals. They have millions of dollars. Got... Well, because they're not working toward anything that matters. It was working toward the gold medal, working to make that movie going to auditions and pushing through the failure and having this goal that you set for yourself, working on it is what gives your life meaning. 
And that's why I wanted to start this series of life-changing episodes of the Mel Robbins podcast, the foundational stuff about how you create a better life with goal setting. Because goal setting from this point forward must be a part of your life if you want to feel a greater sense of purpose and meaning, period. And so I want you to come back to this episode. I want you to bookmark it. I want you to share this with people that you care about. If you've got somebody like I do who's a college senior, and as they approach graduation and they start to feel like they're about to have a quarter-life crisis and they're lost, you know what they need? They need goals. If you have a friend going through divorce, you know what they need? They need goals. If you're bored in life or feeling stuck or you've got to hit the reinvention button, you know what you need? You need goals. And you can re-listen to this every single quarter at any moment in your life and walk yourself through this very simple but powerful and life-changing research to get very clear about what you want and why you want it and how you're going to go achieve it. Now, speaking about the how, you want to know how? Habits are how you achieve goals. Systems are how you make it easier. And so coming up next in this life-changing series, we're going to do a 101 on habits. What the science says about habits, the three components that make a new habit encode and stick in your brain. And we're also going to give you the research-backed shortcuts that you can use to make new habits stick and to make that change and the new habits that are going to help you achieve your goals easier to implement in your life. That's what's coming next. But for now, I want you to remember the definition of a goal. A goal is anything that you desire that wouldn't otherwise happen without you doing something. The leaves served their purpose. When the leaves are green, the leaves are bringing energy to the tree and the tree is returning energy in the form of water. The reason why the leaves start to change is because the tree starts to pull back. The tree starts pulling back on the amount of water that it is sending to the leaves. The tree is starting to let go. The leaf no longer serves a purpose. And this is an important thing to say because so often we have trouble letting go of friendships, of habits, of jobs, of, for me, where I lived and raised our kids for 26 years. We recently sold our home, and by God, I held on to that for probably two years longer than we needed to because I had trouble letting go. But what I want you to focus on is that when something has a purpose in your life, that's an amazing thing. And it's also normal for something to serve a purpose during a specific period of time and to no longer serve a purpose in your life now or in the life you want to create. And so when you honor that a friendship served a purpose, and a really good example of this is, you know how whenever you um, have a new job or you move an apartment or you move to a city, that all of a sudden the patterns in your life change and your friendships change. And your friendships change because now you're doing different things. So you're bumping into different people. It doesn't mean that you're no longer friends with the people that you used to hang out with at work. But the friends that you had at work served a particular important purpose during that period of your life. There was an equal exchange back and forth. What you gave, you received back. It's why you ate lunch with the same people every day. You enjoyed them and they enjoyed you. But now that you live somewhere else, putting a ton of energy back into that relationship when you're not going to get the same back, it doesn't serve the same purpose. And that's why when you let go of friendships, you also need to let go of the judgment on yourself like there's something wrong with me and am I doing something wrong and do I have any friends? Of course you have friends. The patterns of your life have changed. You're putting energy somewhere else because you're getting energy from somewhere else. This is the natural 
cycle of life. It's the natural cycle of relationships. And I find that when you really honor the things that you need to let go of, whether it's a job you no longer like or a house you no longer want to live in or a friendship you don't see very often, or maybe it's some habit, maybe it's some habit that you used to have. So when you say something serves a purpose, you actually honor. You honor the energy it used to give you. You honor the fact that you put something into it. And you also honor the fact that not everything is going to be in your life forever. And that's what allows you to let go. You start to let go when you realize that holding on to things is holding you back. And in particular, holding on to the guilt and the judgment that you layer onto yourself that you should, but I feel guilty, but this, but that, that is definitely holding you back from creating a new life and from creating space for something new to happen. And see, that's one of the reasons why you have to learn how to let go. Because when you continue to pour your energy into things that no longer give you energy back, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill your happiness. It's going to kill your vitality. It destroys your motivation. It makes you feel depleted. It makes you feel like you're the last on your list. And so that's reason number one. And the second reason why you have to start to let go of what doesn't serve you is because as long as you are holding on to the old stuff, you have no time, no space, and no motivation to create anything new, period. And you know this. So here's what we're going to do. You and me, we're bringing the fun. And rule number one, stop focusing on all the logistics. Focus on the laughter. I'm not kidding about this. I want you to weave laughter into the logistics. If you did the work ahead of time to plan for fun and to make sure it's fun, it will be fun. And, you know, when I say don't just focus on the logistics, also focus on the laughter, I want to tell you a quick story. So we're hosting Thanksgiving this year, and my husband, thank God, is handling the logistics. And so he put together an email, and he, you know, assigned all the things out that everybody was doing. And, yeah, bring the dogs and, you know, bring a bathing suit and blah, 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 blah. And um, everybody replies back, excited to see you. And we are. We're so excited to get together. And so now as the emails are starting to fly, I'm starting to feel excited. But everybody's just kind of commenting on the logistics. We'll be there Thursday. We'll be there Wednesday night. We're going to bring the dog. Blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, our son Oakley replies. And he replies in all caps, people, we are going to destroy this feast, exclamation word. And I just laughed out loud. That could be you. Why not reply to the family logistics text chain with a hilarious gif of somebody dancing with a turkey? Why not put in a hilarious photo of somebody in the family? Why not bring the fun? So don't just focus on the logistics. Make sure you focus on the laughter too. Now, let's talk about step two. How do you stop falling into the, oh, fun will just happen spontaneity category, and you fall into the, I'm going to make this fun thing happen category? Well, let's look at the research. People who are happy do things that make them happy. That's one of those studies where I'm like, yeah, duh. But then you're like, oh, no wonder I'm not happy. I'm not doing anything or prioritizing happiness. They work at things that make them happy. And it makes sense because when you try things that make you happier, you're a happier person. Well, guess what? The exact same research relates to fun. It's seriously so obvious. It's kind of stupid. But let's have some fun with it, right? Let's not be embarrassed. Your life becomes fun when you plan things that are fun to you. Or even when normal things, you just bring a fun attitude like our son did to the email chain. All caps, exclamation, let's go, people. And on that note, I want to share a story with you about the power of bringing the fun, okay? Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Thankfully, um, we have somebody in our family who's incredible at this. Our oldest daughter, Sawyer, who's 23 years old, this woman always brings the fun. I mean, she is always doing something really fun with her friends. Uh, you know, I can give you a few examples. There was one year where she and her friends were out in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I was looking at the photos online, and they were out at bars 
in these colonial costumes, literally, like think Holly Hobby, bonnets, prairie dress, apron. They had gone on a bar crawl in costume, in col- like looking like women from a colonial era, like Little House on the Prairie. It was such a riot that that people all over Breckenridge were stopping them. They were featured on the Breckenridge uh, Facebook page. People were taking photos with them. I mean, talk about bringing the fun. That's hilarious. I mean, I'd never think to order costumes and go on a themed bar crawl. Who does that? Well, apparently people who have fun do that. Another thing that she did recently is we had all of her her college friends from Boston College up with their moms for a big mother-daughter weekend. And when we found out that one of the moms who was a widow had just gotten engaged to her boyfriend, Sawyer turned to me and said, let's throw a wedding. I'm like, throw a wedding? She's like, yeah, we're going to throw a wedding. And sure enough, impromptu, they made a sash for the mom. We made a veil out of a paper towel, like, you know, like a long thing of paper towel and flowers out of like, like, I don't, like foil. And then we blew bubbles and we had her daughter who was wearing this huge foam hat walk her down the aisle in our living room. And then Sawyer went like, it was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Why? She brought the fun. When she heard something, she leaned into it and we just, it was just amazing. And she also did this repeatedly during quarantine. So quarantine was actually a really awesome time for our family once we got over the grieving and we settled into the routine of being together because our kids brought the fun. Sawyer went through and made an entire chart for the month of March, and she came up with theme nights every other night. There was a family Olympics night. There was a bake-off where we uh, divided up into teams and we had to bake desserts and we also had to dress up as chefs. I mean, it was super fun. But the most fun night was a night that I had never heard of. This is a theme you should steal. I love this. It's an anything but clothes dinner. And what does that mean? I didn't know either. It means you have dinner with your family wearing anything but clothes. You're not supposed to go nude. You are supposed to wear something other than clothes. So Sawyer, for example, took two huge king-size pillows and duct taped them all around her. So she put one in the front, one in the back, and then duct taped it. So that was her clothes or her outfit. Uh, I can't remember what Oakley wore, and I can't remember what Kendall wore, oddly enough. But I took a champagne bottle box, and I put it across my chest. And I, uh, the way that I, I fastened it to me is I poked holes in the top of it and then I put a s- ribbon around it and hung it like a necklace and then put duct tape on the side so it stayed in place. And then I made a pair of pants out of brown uh, grocery store garbage bags, like one bag per leg, and then taped the front together. Now, Chris, Chris's outfit was something. Um, Chris took a like a rubber pot lid so you know how you have like a metal pot lid well somebody gave us once these like kind of uh rubber lids that you can put on top of dishes like in the summer so that flies can't get them and it had like a little knob on it he hung this thing across the front of him <laughs> in front of his private parts and that's all he wore except for a pair of clogs and socks. I mean, when he came down the stairs, I almost had a heart attack. He had, on a, he had basically a pot lid across the front of him with a ribbon around his waist and clogs on. I'll tell you, we have laughed about that moment forever. And every time, you know, we get into a fight, Chris threatens to wear that to the rehearsal dinner for one of our kids' weddings. What you're going to learn is that it's not that hard. It only takes one additional person to cause a major shift with you and have the fun be what everybody remembers. That's what we're going to do this holiday season. In fact, this is called the first follower theory. When you're the one person doing something out of the ordinary, people think you're crazy. Like think about if you were to go in at the holidays and 
you're wearing some silly outfit. One of my favorite things to do is to buy themed blazers. You can get them really cheap on Amazon that are just ridiculous. Whether they have turkeys all over them or they have like, you know, holiday decorations or they blink or whatever. Hilarious. If you're the only one wearing one, you might feel like an idiot. When two of you show up, now there's a party. That first follower that joins in with you turns you from you're an idiot to this looks like fun. Same's true about a dance floor, right? The first person that gets up, you're like, ooh, bad dance move. The second one, you're like, mm, maybe I'll go, right? That's how you go from being the lone nut job to being the leader of the fun train, everybody. That's how fun becomes a movement. And so I'm going to take the first follower theory and I'm going to recruit someone to help me. And I want you to do the same. I am going to get our daughter Sawyer on the line because she is the CFO, the chief fun officer of the Robbins family. And so as I get Sawyer on the line, I want you to think of your chief fun officer, the person you're going to drag in to help you. Because if you both are like, come on, guys, everyone will be like, all right. And the fun bus will run the resignation and the cynicism right on over and make sure that fun bus has a damn good uh, music dance party mix, too, because that'll also bring the energy up. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado... We'll be right back because we're going to take a short break. But when we come back, I'm going to introduce you to the CFO, Chief Fun Officer of our family, Miss Sawyer Robbins. Oh, and we're going to talk about how the hell we're going to make our holidays fun. And in the process, we're going to give you some amazing ideas for how you can do the same. Okay. So, Soy, thank you for being here because you know what? You are the funniest person in our family. Not only because you have the best sense of humor and you have the wittiest and driest sense of humor, but you also bring the fun and you make our family so much better because of it. And I just love that about you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, literally, dude, everything. I mean, the foam hats, your idea. Dinner without clothing, your idea. A bar crawl in colonial costumes, your idea. Throwing a fake wedding, your idea. How the heck did you become so fun? Um, that is a <laughs> tough question. Um, honestly, I feel like first off, I'm just very outgoing and obnoxious. So I think that that kind of plays a role into it. But I think that I have been fortunate enough to be a part of friend groups where all we want to do is have fun and do things that are out of the ordinary. And um, I don't know, you can always just go to a bar, but it's more fun to dress up as like old women to go there <laughs> <laughs> to just go alone. That's what I was for Halloween. I was a I was a granny. Can you please describe your costume to everybody? Because I think it's one of the best costumes I've ever seen. Um, I wore a wig and I got glasses and pearls and I got a cane and I was wearing like a sweater. I don't know. And I, I, I looked on probably 15 YouTube tutorials of how to make your makeup look like old women. And so I had like wrinkles all over me and a big mole. So, yeah. Oh, and you know what other detail I loved? What you had on like New Balance geriatric sneakers, <laughs> and you oh, had yeah, a, that. you had a COVID mask hanging from one of those eyeglass things. I mean, the attention to detail, and that's why I wanted to talk to you, because this is the first year that our family is hosting Thanksgiving at Ground Zero for Thanksgiving, which is the Southern Vermont House. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there are traditions that used to go with the Southern Vermont house when your grandparents owned the house. And now that we are the owners of the house, and this is the first Thanksgiving that we're inviting the extended family to come, that we should probably get really intentional about mixing up the traditions and inserting a lot more fun. Mm-hmm. That sounds great, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Why? 
like, do you think that thanks that that holidays are normally not that fun? No, I think they're fun. I I love holidays. Um, if I could, I would just have Christmas all year long. But the fact that Thanksgiving is always a good time in when politics are not talked about or money or people's like life. I don't know. I feel like all we talk about is the boring stuff and what everyone does for work. And then Uncle Tom does his accents and everyone laughs and we have the exact same memories told over and over again. And then we go to bed. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm down for some more fun this year for sure. I agree. So can you give me some ideas? Because you're a way more creative thinker than I am. And I remember when we were quarantining, you came up with a chart of themed evenings that we were going to do as a family in order to mix up the doldrum and to create things to look forward to. What did you get? I got that my sister is very kind. No jokes. No jokes. I'm not. I'm being serious. No, I want you to talk about you. Okay. You have to just go for it and um, Here's the thing. And not focus so much on what you're afraid of and being comfortable, but just do the thing that scares you. Which It's even bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you wish to be happier, do you know what life gives you? Things that make you sad. <laughs> and then you have to figure out how to be sad or happy when things are sad. You know what happens when you say that you want peace in your life? You want things to be easier? Oh, you know what bubbles to the surface? All the stuff that's broken. And then you have to bring and figure out how to bring peace to this. And so for you, there is something that you needed to do in Florida. So you would get serious about doing the work back here. And that there was something in the breakdown and whatever it is that you want to call it that was meant for you because you clearly needed it to come back here and actually do what you're meant to do. And look, it might take 30 years, but it'll be the best damn Netflix special I have ever seen in my entire life. One of the things that I'll never forget is that when I started arguing for her dreams, that's when she got really emotional. You probably heard her choking up when I said, you're moving back and you're going for it and it's going to be the next best damn Netflix special you've ever had. It may take 30 years. And that's what's available to you too. Because the bottom line is, don't you dare listen to this and spend your time writing to me or DMing me about your excuses, about how old you are or how late you are or how much you've screwed up your life. Do you understand you are listening to a 54-year-old woman who had been thinking about launching a podcast since 2011? And I'm just four weeks into this. If I can reinvent my life and clear out the bullshit that I am doing to argue against my dreams, If I can get in touch with what is truly calling me and claim it and be honest and turn toward it and figure out how to make it a reality, so can you. And the fact is, absolutely everything that has sucked about your life or where you are right now, you needed because you needed to experience unhappiness to realize, I want to be happy. You needed to feel small to realize that's not what's meant for you. You know, I thought that I was going to be a daytime talk show host. I thought that was my big dream. I would like follow the giants like Ellen and Oprah and all these incredible people. And you know what happened? I did that job at CBS Broadcast Center with Sony Pictures for a year. And then I got fired from that job when COVID hit. Literally. And I was lost. And you know what I learned from that experience? I learned that that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't actually like it at all. 
I loved the people. I loved the machine. I did not like the product at all. There was something that was off. Every single thing that is happening to you is happening for those dreams of yours. And see, maybe you needed the breakdown that you're in in order to realize you deserve to be happy. Maybe you needed that job you didn't like to realize you better get serious about creating what you want. Maybe you needed to apply to law school and get there and go, not for me, to realize something else was meant for you and you should stop denying the fact that you wanted to go into a creative field. So do not let the fact that you have spent a certain amount of time or you're a certain age or you're too early or you're too late or all of that crap to invalidate the truth. The truth is you're right on time. If you're having the wake-up call that I intend for you to have as you listen to this, as you're realizing that your dreams are as alive as they have ever been, if you are starting to go, oh my God, I've been against myself, I'm going to be for myself. If you're starting to say, wow, I really have put the lid on. I really have stopped allowing myself or giving myself permission to have something incredible happen in my life. If you're having the wake-up call that I intended, good. Now let me tell you something else. There is no deadline on your dreams, and there is no age at which you're supposed to do this. You can start a business at 18. You can quit the job you had out of college at 24. You can go back to technical school after getting a master's at 31. You can literally adopt a child at the age of 39 when you're single. You can go to nursing school after you've raised your kids and you're 42 years old. You can learn how to teach your first online course at the age of 48. You could become a podcast host at the age of 54. You could get married for the first time at 63. You could skydive at 71. You could run your first marathon at 82. Your dreams do not disappear. There is no age at when you can't do something or when you're too early. It's complete bullshit. Your dreams are something you were born with. They are your responsibility, and they are also the life force inside of you. So stop running away from them and turn toward them. Run toward your dreams. Stop arguing against them and be the loudest voice for them. And for crying out loud, stop extinguishing that flame that's burning inside you. Enough with the excuses, enough with the jokes and the downplaying, enough with this fear. Your job is to turn toward that flame, turn toward that flame and freaking fan it, fan it with all your might. That flame inside you is supposed to burn bright. And the only way that that's going to happen is when you are honest with yourself about that thing you've been denying, about that calling that you feel, about the fact that you're meant for more than where you're at right now, that you deserve to be happy, that those dreams are real, and you have within you the ability to chip away at them, and that when you wake up every single day and you write down those five dreams and you see and you hear and you feel the fact that your life has clues, your life is trying to help you, your life is trying to help you become who you're destined to become. I want you to know something. You're going to wake up happier every day. You're going to wake up feeling more alive and more self-expressed and more connected and energized when you wake up for your dreams. And I also want you to know that your friend Mel Robbins, I'm going to be right here beside you. I'm going to be here every single step of the way because I see you. I believe in you. I believe in your dreams and I believe in your ability to make them come true. And so that's why I'm here. And I just feel as we, whatever season of your life that you're in, whenever you hear this episode, this is when you're meant to hear this. There are no mistakes. And those dreams of yours are no joke. They are serious business and they're your responsibility. So five, four, three, two, one, 
Stop fucking arguing and joking and making excuses and get your ass out there and fan the flame and start working on them. There are two rules that I want you to start practicing right now because these are the two big energy drainers, okay? And you can start today. Energy drainer number one, any time you're complaining. That's right. Complaining to yourself is a complete energy drain, period. We were heading here to the studio. There was a ton of traffic. We were running late. I could feel the negative wave of stress coming. I could feel the depleted, the depletion coming. I could feel it all happening. I could feel the thought, the thoughts starting to go. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That is when you are sucking your own energy dry. I started complaining. Should have got out of early. Should have done this. Should stop complaining. Stop complaining about that job you don't like. Stop complaining about the traffic. Stop complaining about your partner. Stop complaining about your weight. Stop complaining about the things in your life. Because here's the truth. With a little bit of effort and a little better attitude and a little positive energy, you can freaking change anything because you can take the actions that change anything. And so instead of bitching about the job, get busy tomorrow morning and start looking for a new one. Instead of complaining that you don't have any friends, spend some time putting yourself in activities where you're going to meet new people. This is so important. Anywhere in your life where you are complaining, you are your own energy drain because you are pouring negative energy at something instead of redirecting that same effort and attitude and just ugh into something positive. So that's rule number one. No complaining. I dare you. Try to go 24 hours and not complain about anything today. It's next to impossible. I would love to hear from you if you take this challenge on. Seriously, I would. Just tag me on social media. Tell me how the 24-hour rule is going of no complaining. Rule number two, stop trying to control other people. Stop it. I was at an event in Las Vegas with my friend, not Las Vegas, I was at an event in Los Angeles with my friend Kathy Heller. And we took a bunch of questions from the audience. And this particular question from uh, one woman, I can't stop thinking about. How do you stop controlling your friends? You stop. That's how you do it. When you catch yourself trying to control someone, and then you let go of the desire to change them, and you redirect all of that angst and energy toward caring, listening, supporting, creating this reciprocal exchange of allowing them to show up exactly as they are, you get connection back. Your attempt to control somebody blocks connection. It blocks the exchange between people. And here's one more thing about letting go when it comes to relationships. Maybe sometimes the purpose that some people play in your life is simply to teach you how to let go. Let's go back to the top of Haystack Mountain in southern Vermont because our friend Mel Robbins, she has huffed and she has puffed and step by step she has made it to the top of Haystack Mountain. And there's something interesting about that. It's an example of how putting in the effort, throwing in the energy, and doing things that may be hard, they may be a struggle, they may make you pant and turn bright red in the face. They may make you uh, feel like maybe you can't do this. That's good. That is so good. Because when you push yourself to do something out of your comfort zone, that is positive. And what do you get back? You get back all kinds of positive energy in return. You feel pride. You feel happy. You grow a little bit. You get a great view. And speaking of view, Mel has something that she wants to say to you to wrap this up. The other amazing thing about hiking and uh, being out here in the woods and climbing on top of a mountain is that once you actually get to the top, your whole brain distorts how painful it was to cross the bridge, hike the trail, and go step by step to get where you wanted to go. Um, but it just goes to show you with just a little bit of consistent effort and an optimistic attitude, inch by inch, step by step, you can make anything happen. Oakley, I have to stop you because I want to point out two really critical things. Number one, you stopped caring 
about what other people thought. Now, look, you had it easy because you were locked in your house, so you didn't have to see people. But when you can figure out how to care more about how you feel today about yourself, rather than focusing on caring whether or not people are going to pick on you for the skinny jeans or your poodle perm in my case, when you can actually stop caring and you can care more about your own happiness, that right there changes everything. And so what you're describing is you had this epiphany that we all need to have, which is the only thing that matters is whether or not you're waking up today and you are going to do things that make you happy. That's the only thing that you should care about. And there's a second thing that I want to point out. Instead of being surrounded by people who were critical of you, which is what was happening in school, you were now stuck at home with four people who love you. Exactly. I knew they loved me and I knew that they respected me. And I'd wake up every day and I wouldn't like look in the mirror and be like, well, there are my man boobs. There's like my ugly ass double chin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see that. I'd look in the mirror and be like, today's, today's a day. Time to go fucking play Xbox for 30 hours. Like, you know, <laughs> like it was awesome because we were all together and it was awesome. But it was just like I was walking every day and I was enjoying my time and I wasn't ever like getting down on myself. And what I came to realize is that when I worry about what other people think of me, it like drags me the hell down. Mm. And when I didn't think about other people or I didn't think about what they were thinking about me, I wasn't like, yeah, like I bet they look so stupid right now or I bet their hair looks ugly because like I didn't know, nor did I give a shit. So I wasn't trying to impress anybody and no one was trying to impress me. So what I really realized was that when social scenarios get in the way and you are worried about what other people think of you, that's when you get down on yourself. Mm. Well, one of the things that I've noticed about you, Oakley, is that you're not on social media a lot. And based on the research, there's a lot of kids that came out of that two-year weird period in our lives way worse in terms of mental health because they spent that time at home mainlining social media. So even though they weren't in school, they were online doing that same comparison thing in isolation on their own. It is so freaking damaging when you mainline social media and you use it as a battering ram. And then you say to yourself, well, I hate myself. I hate the way I look. I wish I looked like that. And so I think that's an important thing to point out, Oak, that you weren't sitting there doing that probably because you were on Xbox playing video games for 30 hours a day. But that's a big deal. And so there was a very poignant moment that you described to me that I keep thinking about. And I would love for you to share this moment with everybody because you're so lucky that this happened when you were 17. It's poignant that self-hatred ends when you stop criticizing yourself. Like the comparison is something that we can all work on. But the self-criticism that we engage in relentlessly, every single one of us, that's the source of self-hatred. So describe this moment where you had this amazing breakthrough. You only go through life with yourself. You are the only person that you wake up with and you go to sleep with every single night and every single day. And you are the only person that you need to please. You are not going to live your whole life with the ability to please everyone else because that's not going to make you happy. Because at the end of the day, if you're not happy, other people's happiness won't boost you. It's it won't true. make you feel better. That's a crazy simple way to explain how profound it is when you learn how to accept, be kind to, and eventually love yourself. And you said something to me when we were talking about this that I thought was really like so simple, but also gut wrenching in its truth, which is when you were removed from the situation of walking into school, where you were worried people are going to pick on you, worried about whether you fit in, trying to get the attention off you, all of this energy pointed at managing this. And it's all energy that is based on the belief that there's something wrong with you. Yeah. 
that when that got removed and you were just quarantining with me and dad and your two older sisters, you had this epiphany where you're like, well. There's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I want to start with um, a particular post that you put on social media that went crazy viral and it really struck a nerve for me. And you posted this thing where you said, at 32 years old, I realized I was a child in an adult body. And this just hit deep for so many people. What did you mean? What I thank you um, for for calling out that post. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of us, that, that can be really challenging um, to hear that about ourselves. And for me, if I'm speaking honestly, it was very challenging to come to that awareness. And what I met was mainly around my emotions and the way that I hadn't learned, um, of course, in early childhood to, to tolerate, to navigate, to be able to process my emotions. And in many ways, and I use this language, I think this is the, the part that becomes difficult is in a lot of ways, I was very emotionally immature in the way that I handled the frustrations, the difficulties, and the stresses of life. Because the reality for me, as I think is the case, which is I think why it resonates force with so many of us, is that so few of us, for many different reasons, which I'm sure we'll dive into many of which today, um, we didn't have those safe environments. We didn't have those emotionally attuned caregivers who themselves learned how to navigate their own emotions. So, I mean, needless to say, parenting is a is a large, large task in and of itself. And, you know, when we don't have that safety and we don't have someone modeling, mirroring, attuning to us emotionally, what we do then appear is like a child in an adult body. I want to take a step back because for those of you who have not uh, read Dr. Nicole's New York Times number one best-selling book, which is a game changer, how to do the work, um, I, or you don't follow her online like millions and millions and millions of people do. Can you tell everybody what your life looked like at the age of 32? Because, you know, when you talk about emotional immaturity, it's not like you were running down the street naked, taking a baseball bat to the side of a wall, like kind of rambling gobbledygook. You were high functionally high functioning and successful. So we just give everybody like, what does life for Dr. Nicole at 32 look like when you have this realization that, holy shit, I can't process my emotions maturely. Yeah. And, and I'll be the first to say, I wasn't able to even admit that or even have that language um, for what was going on at the time. What I did know was that I had finally arrived or so I thought to the end of all of this, you know, achievement based to do list. Um, to speak to your point, I I wasn't, you know, kind of dysfunctional in the very traditional sense. I had, in a lot of ways, I had the successful, you know, life or at least appearance of life around me. Um, I was in a partnership, a committed partnership. I had a successful practice after achieving my PhD. Um, I was surrounded by, you know, a network of supportive individuals. I was living in the city that I chose to live in. Everything seemingly on the outside, right, was reflecting this idea that I should feel good or at least better than I was. So I, you know, I think as a lot of us do, my first feeling was a really low, a disempowered lack of fulfillment and shame. Um, because again, as I looked around, I kept almost telling myself, well, what is wrong with you, Nicole? Why aren't you, you know, feeling good about yourself? Why aren't you feeling fulfilled? Why aren't you feeling even connected to this life that you created? So not having the awareness of, of why I was struggling right alongside with, at that point, the clients that I had been working with week after week, month after month, um, I kept I wondering, you know, feeling as a disempowered then clinician in the room, what is wrong? Why are so many of us stuck? Those of us who even have access to supportive individuals like myself in a therapeutic environment, why is the report I'm getting week after week, not that I'm getting better, but that I'm getting more and more frustrated, more and more shameful, more and more stuck in these patterns. And for me, it really began with exploring, you know, what is keeping so many of us stuck 
Um, and for me, I landed on the answer being all of the conditioning, oftentimes very stress-based, very trauma-based conditioning that, you know, was emblematic of the childhoods that most of us have grown up in that were creating habits and patterns that no matter how much insight, how much awareness that we had, were keeping us disconnected from ourselves, from our life and from our relationships. So as you are talking and somebody's listening intently going, wait a minute, is there a different way to experience life? <laughs> I, you know, because adulthood, it's so familiar sounding that you check all the boxes. Ivy League degree, you know, you're practicing psychologist, you are uh, successful on the outside, you're surrounded by all these people, and you're having this internal crisis and disconnect where you're going, why am I not happy? What, what is wrong with me? What more could there be? How can I not figure this out? I am sure most everybody listening can relate to this. And so we're going to get into what you did. But if somebody is going, that's me, that's me right now, what is something, Dr. Nicole, that you want to tell them right now about what this means if you're experiencing this disconnection from what your life is like? today and what you're feeling inside. You know, I speaking from the perspective of of having been that person. I mean, as I, you know, was entering my 30s, I convinced myself because I too saw similar, you know, complaints. I heard similar complaints and I almost gaslit myself in a lot of ways with this idea, like you're sharing, Mal, of this, this must be just what adulthood is. Um, this might just be the circumstances of the, you know, environments, very unnatural. I was living in a city myself that many of us are living. And it took me, you know, becoming conscious again of the very real impact of these habits and patterns to create just that little bit of space. So what I want to offer to anyone who's resonating and has that embedded belief that this is just what life is about, or maybe, you know, a, a more problematic belief, I think for ourselves is maybe this is just what my life is meant to be about. Maybe there's something inherently wrong with me, you know, that is translating to this lack of fulfillment, this overwhelming stress or whatever it might be for you. And so very much speaking from that person as well, I thought that something was just, you know, off about me. Um, I want to share, you know, the hope of creating that space of really, and you'll often hear me break down as far as I see the process of creating change into two major steps. And the first step I will always note is becoming conscious. And when we become conscious of how habitual, how patterned we are as individuals, then some of us can gift us with that little bit of space that then allows us to take that next step, which is beginning to make new choices outside of those old ingrained habits to then be able to experience Ourself differently. And I'm really being intentional with that because, again, I think the best, you know, the best shifting of beliefs is when we ourselves begin to create change, begin to experience life differently. Many of us, I'm sure, have listened to motivational speakers who have said, oh, you can do this, you know, come on this side of, of life, of change. And it really isn't, and again, speaking from my own experience of this, we don't believe it until we do it. But when mm. we be, do become conscious or as we begin to become conscious, we can gift ourselves with that space. Of course, does not happen overnight, but over time, we can may begin to then make new choices, relieving ourselves of that shame, that belief that this is just what life is all about and or this is what my life is all about. Well, this is one of the reasons why I love you so much, not only because you've made a huge difference in my life, and I'm going to try to take a highlighter and call out a couple of those things that you have said that were complete paradigm shifters for me and helped me achieve level up moments in my own healing. And so I want to um, just, un I want to make sure everybody heard something, which is even the awareness that you feel stuck, even the awareness that something is off, even the awareness that this isn't working is great news. Because if I'm hearing you correctly, being frustrated or feeling discombobulated in your body about your life that is the consciousness that you're talking about? Yes, 100%. I mean, anything that we can attune to feeling 
even the lack of, because I know for a lot of us, we feel numb. Um, for me, that was very par- much part of my journey um, is feeling apathetic, not actually feeling much of anything though, to speak to your, you know, very beautiful celebration of that awareness. The moment we start to say, okay, you know, I don't feel anything, or I feel so depressed or whatever it is that I do feel when I am able to see or witness, that's what consciousness means to, for me. And honestly acknowledge that that's the case for my circumstances, then we are actually beginning the process of creating change. Yeah, this is going on right now in real time in my life because we were just having dinner last night for my husband's birthday and our daughter um, has asked my husband, when do you feel most alive? What experiences make you feel most alive? And after Chris answered, I turned to her and I said, I've heard you say that word alive a number of times. Where is that coming from? And she said, well, it's because I don't feel that alive in my life right now. And I think when you have those insights, you're right to go, you know, I was celebratory because I'm trying to highlight the fact that most of us react to that insight that, holy shit, I I don't feel excited by my life. I don't feel like myself. I don't feel alive. It's scary when you have that moment of consciousness. It's incredibly scary, you know, feeling um, as many of us do when we're on that blind autopilot, especially if our autopilot is driven by a a state of nervous system disconnection. I often connect many of the conversations, many of the habits and patterns that we're beginning to talk about now back to our physiological body. Um, And there actually is a state of shutdown that many of us, I found myself living in that created, and it wasn't to say like you were, we were going back to the beginning, right? I was still marching through life, you know, checking endless boxes of to-do list. It wasn't that I was apathetic sitting on a couch though. For some of us, that's how it presents. We don't feel motivated. We procrastinate. We actually can't get up and do much of anything though. Some of us are still able to continue to literally just live life going through the motions and our emotions are what makes us a human. So feeling very much, I talk about my spaceship that I was living on, the spaceship of disconnection that again began for me in childhood does create this feeling, this embodied existence of living like a robot. So when we rob ourselves of our emotional experience of life, we're robbing ourselves, in my opinion, of life itself. But again, as often as the case, there are reasons embedded in our mind and our body that have created that experience, even of that distance, that disconnect, that apathy, that lack of motivation, that procrastination, whatever it is, that isn't a reflection of who you really are, what is meant for you in life, but again, is an adaptive coping mechanism, usually around your earliest environments or circumstances. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.